Hello once again to your viewers. You're watching Airy TV. Welcome to this week's uh, open mic session with uh, uh, my guest for this evening, Miss Susan Nongi. Uh, she is the UNDP country representative uh, that uh, has taken post uh, right after Christine Umutoni. Yeah. Indeed. So please do uh, tell me uh, more about yourself and uh, uh, we will speak mostly about the achievements she has seen within the country and uh, the cooperation level that mm -hmm. uh, has been reached between uh, the UNDP family and uh, the Eritrean government. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So you've already introduced me. I'm Susan Namondo Ngongi. We cannot forget the Namondo because okay. that's what ties me to a group of people from the foothills of Mount Cameroon. I'm from Cameroon. I'm a UN civil servant, um, again, as you've mentioned, and now I'm serving in Eritrea. I've been in Eritrea now for nine months, I believe. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's, many of us, we, 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 we don't understand how, how it really works, the operation, you know, the, the function of the UNDP and uh, the UN family. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, please uh, to tell me uh, about the operations here in Eritrea. Well, before I talk about the operations here in Eritrea, I think the first thing that viewers should note, you know, UNDP and the entire UN family is created by governments. These are institutions created by governments to support governments and their peoples in their development aspirations. The family here in Eritrea, not so big. We have about six um, resident agencies, but we have quite a few agencies that are operating from outside Eritrea, for instance, IFAD, UNESCO, et cetera. And we um, sign um, a plan of cooperation with government. We have the strategic framework um, for cooperation. And the latest one that we have now is from 2017 to 2021. But UNDP has been in Eritrea since 1992. It had a liaison office um, way back then. And I think the journey that UNDP has had with government and the rest of the UN family for that matter has been one of great um, growing um, collaboration and partnership. Mm, okay. Um, speaking about the uh, cooperation uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that you've just mentioned, um, now what, what, what sort of cooperation does exist between uh, these two, the UNDP and the UN family, uh, the UN agencies that we have here and uh, the government of Eritrea, especially in meeting uh, the, the objectives of development mm -hmm. uh, and progress? I think it has varied over time, but the latest um, partnership for cooperation, we're working in um, several areas, um, working with government in the area of social services, education, health, um, working with government in um, the area of agriculture, um, working with government in the area of environment and climate change, uh, supporting government in, a, in, in the different ways, the different parts of their development um, um, aspirations. But that has changed over time. I hope that someday we really look at what the UN has done over the years. My understanding is in the early days we were engaged in things like um, resettlement of um, refugees from Sudan, for instance, or those that um, were deported from Ethiopia, to now doing more um, um, truly development work, supporting agriculture, um, supporting development of, um, of um, um, systems, the health systems, education systems, etc. Mm -hmm. In Eritrea, I wear two hats. One hat is to represent UNDP and the work mm -hmm. that UNDP does, and I'll speak to that. And the other hat is actually to coordinate the mm -hmm. development activities of all the different agencies, and I can speak more to that. Specifically on the UNDP hat, I think it has varied over time mm -hmm. what UNDP has done. But the main areas where UNDP is working with government of Eritrea now is on um, um, integrated um, 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 water management, um, um, mm -hmm. forest um, land degradation or trying to reverse land degradation, mm -hmm. um, looking for alternative sources of energy, mostly solar, um, supporting um, some governance um, um, mm -hmm. um, 
functions such as um, the work that has been done with um, the auditing um, mm. functions, the Auditor General's office. So lately, that's really the main area of our focus. And I think some really good things have happened there, for instance. That's I'm really cool. proud, for instance, I'm relatively new, so I, I will butcher all the names, but I'm really proud of some of the things I have seen. The work in um, ANSABA, for instance, on integrated land management. It's a semi-arid uh, arid area and one of the big challenges there is water. Mm -hmm. So just working with the farmers there trying to harvest water through um, the construction of dams, check dams, etc. Mm -hmm. And introducing um, or supporting the farmers to actually practice better, um, um, have better management practices for mm -hmm. their land. Um, I think that's it. my understanding. It's, it's really um, good work. It's been yielding some results. It's been going on from 2014. Um, still happening now. Um, another piece of work that I have come across and I'm really, really proud of is the work with um, providing solar. I think it's um, Zoba de Bob. Um, it's a joint project, government, um, um, UNDP and the European Union. And its aim is to make sure that about 8,000 households have um, electricity. The work is going on now, but we're hoping that by the end of this year, that these 8,000 households will actually have electricity. electricity. I yeah. think that's really amazing. So we've been doing um, different um, pieces of work supporting here and there where we um, government thinks we might be useful in, in this support. Mm -hmm. And I think it's yielding results. The Auditor General function, my understanding is Eritrea has one of the best auditing functions on the continent, for instance. And those are the sort of things that I, I hope that Eritrea would tell the rest of the continent okay. that it has. All right. Okay. Uh, Ms. Susan, um, I, I, I'm going to talk about uh, the achievements that have been registered mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. uh, and what your impressions are. But before that, I want to specifically talk about uh, what has impressed you the most. What has impressed me the most? Mm. I'm stumped. On the development side, I see achievements. I see achievements in health. Those have been talked about um, quite a bit. I see other development achievements. But I cannot help but um, recognize that Eritrea is 26 years old. So I think what has impressed me the most is that the country, after 30 years of uh, very devastating um, conflict, um, the resilience of the people pick themselves up and able to start charting um, a development path um, for the country. I think that has impressed me the most. Because all of these achievements, the ones that we can see, happened within this context. Mm -hmm. And by no stretch of the imagination am I suggesting that things are perfect. Um, nothing is perfect. It's still, I think the aspirations of the Eritrean people still have to be met in many areas. But the efforts that have been deployed to try and get there, that is impressive. All right. Okay, uh, now let's, let's talk about particular achievements in the health sector. Um, we uh, have scored uh, tremendously in uh, the um, uh, Millennium Development Goals, for instance. Uh, and um, I want you uh, to, uh, I want to have uh, your opinion on that. No, and that is one of the better documented areas um, of Eritrea's achievements, and it truly was impressive, especially MDG4, which was under, um, reducing under five mortality. Um, if I remember my figures right, I think in 1995, um, the figures were 136 or 37 um, babies dying per thousand life births. By, nine, by 2015, it had dropped down to 47 um, children dying per thousand life births. That's a significant achievement. And I think Eritrea was one of the, within the top 10 that registered this progress um, on the African continent, which was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. Also in terms of maternal mortality, we know that, um, we know that the rates went significantly down from 900 and something um, in 1995 to 400 and something in 2015. Another area of huge progress, HIV AIDS, was also an area of huge progress um, and really supported by recent policies in 2015 for instance I understand that there was a tr test and treat policy and so anybody who had who was tested 
and was HIV AIDS positive got the treatment regardless of their CD4 count um, level, which is truly remarkable. And my understanding is we're heading towards elimination of maternal to child transmission of HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. Again, remarkable. So for some of these really wonderful stories, especially in the health sector, um, I think the only thing that I would hope is that it's told more and that there's more data. The data that I'm, a, a that I'm citing now, I got from the, um, um, the, health, the health, pl um, health security plan mm -hmm. um, that the government produced last year. So that's some of the data I'm citing, but it's already old. So we need more data to be able to tell the story more. And I hope that Eritrea is interested in telling that story more. Data is incredibly motivating. You know, in the development work, mm -hmm. they're different. It's a huge jigsaw puzzle, and everybody is working on their different pieces um, everywhere. Few mm -hmm. people really have the overall picture of what is happening. When you have data, you are able to gauge whether or not you're heading towards the goal that you'd set for yourself. Mm -hmm. But it, in this case, where you can see progress, it really motivates everybody mm -hmm. to want to do more in the various parts that they are. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, you know, one of those watches that counts the number of steps that you do? <laughs> yeah, no, you laugh, but you know, if you set yourself to do 10,000 steps, it tells you at any point whether or not you've done 10,000, you've done 4,000, you've done 11,000. And if you've done 4,000, well, you're motivated somehow to figure out how you're going to get the rest of your steps. Mm. If you've done 11,000, you realize, okay, you can do 10,000. So maybe y your ambitions should be greater. Data cannot be, in my view, um, overstated, the importance of it. Okay. All right. Um, well, speaking of that, because I had, I had that in, in, in my line of question okay. uh, to you. And how best do you suppose we, we achieve this? Well, um, there is the National Statistics Office exists. It's a sound institution. I think it needs more resources. It needs more people. You have seasoned people who are working there now. But I think you need more people dedicated to it. Um, and you need, I think, the political, um, the political decision that some of these data is truly important um, um, to have so that they are given the resources that they need to be able to get it. I think, as I said, data is hugely motivating. It helps you know whether you're um, attaining the results that you set for yourself. If you're not attaining those results, it helps you know whether or not you need new strategies. Uh, it helps keep everybody, um, um, yeah, everybody sort of on board in terms of the progress that are being made, be it on the economic side, be it on the social front. Um, I think, yeah, important. Mm -hmm. But I think National Statistics Office, which already exists as an institution, should be that house that should be strengthened and given the clear indication that they should go out there and gather this data for development use. Mm -hmm. Data is also hugely sensitive, so it has to be managed properly. But yeah, I think the basic infrastructure is there. It just needs to be strengthened and you know, mm -hmm. expected to deliver on mm -hmm. some of these things. And I'm sure it will. Yeah. Uh, f for instance, the development uh, orientation of, of uh, the government of Eritrea is to reach out the farthest uh, corners of, of Eritrea. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I just uh, w want you taking that. That is fantastic. Uh, what we're talking about nowadays is leave no one behind. In many parts of the world, development has been highly skewed. So the GDP figures show that um, growth is happening in the country. But when you look a little bit closer, you realize that few people are enjoying the benefits of this growth while many are not enjoying the benefits of the growth. In some cases where it is more spread, it might be that a particular group of people in specific places are not enjoying the benefits of the growth while others are enjoying the benefits of the growth. From what we understand from the government's policy, indeed, um, others, um, the government has been trying to make sure that the growth is, is equitable, it's equilibrated, and has deliberately um, put resources into developing the parts of the country that were least uh, or less developed um, before. So that's definitely a good thing. But I come back to my data point earlier. That's an excellent thing. How do you tell that story to others? 
Or how do you make sure that all Eritreans understand that story? I'm sure the government is telling Eritreans um, this story, but when you have data, then all parts of society can see that, mm -hmm. and it's easier to tell that story to others. Mm -hmm. But I think it's laudable what the government is doing in terms of um, decentralizing um, um, mm -hmm. the development activities. All right. Ms. Susan, uh, my, my next question is, is, is about uh, uh, women empowerment. Mm. Uh, uh, handling the gender sensitivity issue uh, correctly uh, and uh, harm, uh, abolishing uh, harmful traditional practices which we have also uh, scored tremendously in that uh, domain. Uh, the UNDP stake in this as well. Um, well, one of the key big areas was uh, female genital mutilation. Um, um, from the numbers that we can see, figures a little bit outdated, but from the numbers we can see, it has gone down tremendously. And it was very concerted action on the part of government, um, the Ministry of Labor and Human Welfare, um, the Women's Organization, National um, Union of Eritrean Women, and others, uh, the Ministry of Health and so, have worked um, um, in a concerted fashion to make sure that this comes down. And it has been coming down significantly. Mm -hmm. And again, I hope we have the latest figures. This is a problem in many parts of the world. In those areas that Eritrea is doing really well in and, and, and making a lot of progress, I think it would be really good for Eritrea to share with the neighbors and the friends and the others um, their um, experience, their practices, their approaches, their programs, etc., that led to the results that they're getting so that others can learn from it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I mean, Africa is is basically uh, has these problems. Yes, uh, yes, that, they're, that common problems yeah, they're, 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 they're common problems. They're common problems, and yes, there is need that we can share and must yes, share yes. our experiences. Yes. Uh, perhaps if, if if there is comparing com uh, contrast that that you would like to make um, on how we have uh, done this, and from your perspective. Uh, from your study here, within your, your, your time here, what, 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 would, what would you say? But that's very limited time. But from the little bit that I can see is that, um, as I mentioned, this huge jigsaw puzzle that is development work, is that the different, um, the different parts are working well together. That the center is able to work well with the Zoba level, that um, um, key actions are able to be decentralized, and that there's clear follow through. Um, that, I think, is important in terms of the results that have been reached. Because for things like FGM, you, you, well, you need an enabling environment, so you need a law. You need a law that says this is not acceptable and that law exists. But beyond that, these are cultural practices also. You need to be able to go into people's homes. You need to be mm -hmm. able to, to explain to them that be beyond this being criminal, that this is also really bad for their daughters. And it's really bad for their daughters because of A, B, C, D, E, F. You need to be able to talk to communities and explain to them. You need to have people mm -hmm. that the communities trust doing this talking to them and explaining, etc. And it mm -hmm. seems to me that the, the chain of activities is really quite well managed. And of course, you have to take that experience from the ground level and find a way to bring it back up mm -hmm. um, for um, policies to be um, um, shaped, mm -hmm. um, to be, yeah, to be shaped and then goes back down. If there is perhaps a lesson to be learned, let me just summarize it up there from Eritrea. I think there are many lessons to be learned from Eritrea. Um, um, but I think for me the key thing, and I'm still relatively new, the key thing is that the government and the people need to be willing to share their stories. If, if you have done great work in area X, Y, or Z, malaria is a huge problem on the continent. Granted, this is not the worst affected area for malaria on the continent, um, um, but still, it's a huge problem for the continent, and Eritrea is, is close, is en route to elimination. Um, maternal to tr um, child transmission of HIV AIDS, it's en route to elimination. Um, very good work done um, as regards um, under five mortality and other health um, related gains. And again, as I said earlier, I don't want to give the impression that everything is perfect, but there are mm -hmm. quite a few, a lot of good things. And I think it's just sharing that story 
that Eritrea should be in the platforms sharing how it has done on some areas. And who knows, maybe there are other countries who are doing well in some of the areas that Eritrea needs to improve on that exactly. Eritrea could learn from. It's a, global, it's a global family after all, and definitely at least as far as the continent is concerned, it's a continental family after all. And I think all um, in the community of nations, we all have obligations to support the advancement and progress um, um, of development. And we all have that obligation, therefore, to share the lessons that we learn and to interrogate the lessons of others and see if they might be applicable to us. Okay. All right, Ms. Susan, uh, we are actually uh, running out uh, of time. But uh, any final words? I think my key message is the first one is Eritrea is part of the UN family and um, we had international service here um, 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 of the UN. Um, I hope that Eritrea can make great use of us um, that will call down on the um, collaboration, support, partnership, etc. that is expected from the United Nations, from the multiplicity of all its organs, because it is a very broad institution, that Eritrea will call down. Um, on what is its due um, um, right in terms of support towards its development aspirations. I think that's my main message. And the second one which came when we were talking about the interview is, at least as far as development work is concerned within Eritrea, that more is done uh, about data. I think that would truly help in terms of taking things um, to the next level and really supporting um, um, Eritreans on their aspirations. Thank you for your time, Ms. Susan. Thank you. Uh, dear viewers, uh, that wraps up this week's Open Mic. It is good night from us.